ever teach you anything because you read the encyclopedias. <laughs> he was. He was, still he, can't tell them anything. Because <laughs> he was, he's a German. <laughs> No, he, Mr. Nichols said he felt he, he, he could never. Mr. Go. Nichols said he couldn't teach you anything. You knew it all no. <laughs> already. No. Oh. You know, that a good background. It's a good school. I remember the uh, there'd be an eighth grade exam, countywide, I think. And uh, three or four times the best grades were from people in, in our, at St. Luke's. So, do they still give the county exam? Oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. There was one time, uh, we never knew what the questions would be except one time they decided it would be a question on art. And we, Mr. Nichols said, we haven't had any art class. And I told him, I, I don't think it's fair because uh, he said, we'll do it, but don't expect much from them. And uh, he said, well, they, they said, this is what, what you're going to have to do. He said, they, to help us out, he said, you're going to have to draw a little, turn out to be like a mortar and pestle, a little cup with a uh, thing with a handle on it, you know, like the grind stuff. You're going to have to, they're going to show you a drawing like that, and you're going to have to make your freehand drawing yourself with it. So we did that. But, uh, other than that, I think we were well prepared always for the thing now. Okay, tell us your name, who you are. And yeah. <laughs> and tell us your name to the camera so we know who you tell are. Tell my name. Yep. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. We started. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm Vernon Newbert. One of the one of my uh, classmates at St. Luke's was Willis Folstead, so I have some notes about remembering uh, Willis Folstead. He went to uh, the school, but he he lived. Uh, I measured yesterday, and I think it was about two miles away. You go down Jefferson Center Road to what we call Newbert's Corner because my uncle George lived on the right hand side. My cousin Floyd lived diagonally across where there's a horse farm now. Then you turn left and uh, Folstead's lived. Up. There's still a, a barn there and I, I measured the other day and I think it's about eight tenths of a mile. So Willis walked maybe almost two miles to school and he had two sisters. Uh, Willis was maybe three, older, three years older than I was. He was my brother Glenn's age and they were in the same grade actually. And he had an older sister Louise who was uh, all, uh, maybe three or four years older than uh, Willis and a, a younger sister Helen who was my age and in my class. Uh, they all three must have walked to school most of the time. His parents were Oscar and Louise, and I haven't remembered uh, Louise's name actually, but she lived very long, I think, to almost a hundred or something. In the summer, Glenn and I would often walk to see Willis for the afternoon. I think we had a way to take a shortcut. We cut in uh, uh, up the road a little bit go through some woods, so we may not have walked two miles every time. But anyway, we would walk over there and then Willis would... I don't know if... We didn't telephone him, so I think he would just see us coming and then we'd do some fun things together. There was a uh, stream, there was a house, and then down the hill a little bit there was the barn, the barn and then down the hill a little bit further there was a stream. And we'd go down there and try to sketch, catch uh, skippers. They were, they looked like spiders and they had the ability to run on, fast on the water, on top of the water always. And we would go down there and try to catch them in our hands. Willis was pretty good at catching the uh, spiders. 
I don't know what they did with them. I don't think I ever caught one. So. And then we would go across the road into a woods. There's a development there now, and uh, I rode around it in a couple of days ago. I think still behind the development there's a uh, woods, and then further beyond that is another stream. But in that woods we would go past a big wall, which was maybe about we were kids then, so maybe everything looked bigger, but it seems though it was about five feet high and maybe 10 or 12 feet in diameter. And what was called out the Indian Rock. And uh, he and his fa whole family called it the Indian Rock. And he said that they think it would have been a good place for the Indians to meet and have meetings on top of the rock. And then uh, maybe do a dance, or Indian dance or something like that. Then we'd go on to a stream, and sometimes we fished in it. Uh, I remember I never caught anything. Then Willis often spoke of, uh, I don't really, really remember if it was a seven foot falls or a ten foot falls, but somewhere in the same stream there was supposed to be a big falls that Willis was always excited about. But. He would usually not take us because he said he'd say it'd be dry now. And I guess it would run mainly in the spring when there were the, maybe there was a spring that fed it in the springtime. But uh, we did go there one time and there was no water coming down. Then Willis was a good softball player when we played it. We played usually at school. He was slim and strong and taller than most of the other kids. I think all the Folksteads tended to be uh, tall men. Uh, he was an excellent horseshoe pitcher. He said he practiced a lot of time at home with his dad. And at the grade school picnic, the boys and young men would play softball and the fathers would pitch horseshoes. And Willis, they'd often come to get Willis, the men, so he would be invited to pitch horseshoes with him. He was the only one, there was nobody else in the school that could pitch horseshoes like Willis, and no, none of the other boys ever got invited to do that, that I remember. Willis was a sensible, gentle person. He was never mean, and he, he never got angry. He smiled easily. He had great respect for his parents. Once he invited us into his kitchen because his parents had gotten a crystal set radio, one of the first in the neighborhood. In those days, uh, that was before radio or television, and uh, so he had actually one of the first radios in the area, and he ran it for us. And then I uh, think a little later, other radio that people started to get other radios, that old fashioned kind that was sort of large shaped. And I think his dad was a carpenter and uh, his mother had taught at St. Luke Parochial School. They were a steady, re respected, dependable family. When I was a freshman in high school, Glenn and Willis were seniors. That was in 1941. That December is when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. There was no free bus service. I think some of the kids went, went to Winfield and some of us went to Butler, depending on where we lived. And we could pay, there was a bus that was run by, I believe McDonald's bus company, that we, we'd have to pay ourselves to ride on. So most of the time, Glenn and I hitchhiked to and from high school, at least the first, my first year. If we got a good ride, we'd be hauled to downtown Butler and then we'd have to walk a few blocks to the school. There were men working at the Armco. They'd start the eight to start at eight o'clock probably. And so Leland Nygert was one of them. He used to pick us up sometimes and he'd drop us off downtown. And then uh, in the evening, we'd have to, have to walk at Center Avenue Hill. I think it was maybe 15 blocks, you know, from. Senior high, senior high school building, junior high school building were downtown at that time. And then we'd go down and 
um, out the center of it, and so, and then we'd hitchhike down 356. The reason I mentioned it was because uh, we were so often walked up the hill with us, so I, I think he must have uh, hitchhiked often too to avoid taking the bus, at least in good weather. And then we'd, we'd get off at our house on 356, and Willis would still have to walk the rest of the way, almost two miles to his home. We often went to the Butler Hire football, basketball games in the, in the evening. Willis and Glenn had driver's license by then, so sometimes Willis would drive and you know, sometimes Glenn would drive. Willis was always hesitant to ask his dad to use their car because he was afraid he might harm it. And then one night when he did drive, we came out after the basketball game. It was probably 8.30 or 9 o'clock and dark and cold. And Willis tried to start the car and it stuck in gear form. And that, that happened a lot in old cars, it would stick in gear. And sometimes you'd get it out, and in that case, we were lucky. We all went out and walked the car, and it came unstuck. So that was a big relief to Willis. He graduated from Butler High School in uh, June of 1942, Willis. He was drafted soon afterward and went to the Army. At that time, servicemen and women were greatly respected. When they came home on leave, they would visit the school in uniform. If a teacher recognized a service person in the hall, the teacher would often invite the person into class for a friendly greeting. Some of the uh, friends of the service person would usually be still in school and would probably walk the halls with the uniform hero during the class breaks. It was also maybe our own custom, but it seemed to be well known to some of the faculty that if a soldier was in school one morning that his student friend might go to a movie at a nearby theater in the afternoon. <laughs> so the Butler Theater was only a block away and the Majestic, I think usually we went to Butler, I only did it twice. And then, uh, then we were, so we wouldn't be in school in the afternoon, we cut class. Then the next morning we had to have an excuse and my mother would just write an excuse. I tell her, you know, I went with Willis to the movie and she'd write an excuse, please excuse Vernon's uh, absence because there was no other <laughs> good excuse she could say. So, and my homeroom teacher was this Morris and I remember I was in room 215. And I remember giving her, uh, telling her, or giving her the written excuse, and she just smiled and said, Well, Vernon, I, I saw you with Willis yesterday, and I didn't expect to see you in the afternoon. So it was, they, they could have easily, uh, other kids did that, uh, they could have easily had someone standing by the door of the Butler Theater and intercepted us, or, and nobody tried to do anything. So I, I think uh, they maybe thought it was a nice thing to do, I don't know. So I'm happy to say I skipped class to attend a movie with Willis during his last leave. And that was the uh, last one was small. Well, uh, Willis must have participated in the Normandy invasion. On June 6, 1944, and then uh, it wasn't until later, we think, from what we heard, that he died a, a couple of days later inland and not on the beach. So we think he made it through the day of the invasion if he was there for the first day, but then uh, was intercepted further inland. And it was, we were still going to school because Eileen remembers uh, Helen being very sad on the, well, it was his sister Helen being very sad on the bus. 
the day after the family got the news. Ellen died uh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago. We visited her sister Louise in New Jersey shortly after that. Louise recalled that their uh, family had some picnics at Indian Row. She had nice memories of going over there with the family. And then she told us, I think, that after the uh, war, the family was given the opportunity to, to uh, bring Willis home. And they thought about it seriously and they decided to let him rest in France. And uh, my cousin David knew we visited Willis Graves in France and sent me a description of the location. And also I think Alfred Moho and somebody in Salzburg has been, I think two different times somebody's been there and sent us pictures of the grave and the mark. So, so I was thinking, uh, Indian Rock is really uh, Wallace's place, so maybe it'd be nice if there were a memorial clock put there someday, but uh, I'm not sure the rock is still there. You know, I went behind the, uh, I went around the development a couple of days ago, and uh, they might have destroyed the rock. I don't know, or maybe it's back in the woods further, and it's still there. But I didn't ask any about it. I think Sir uh, Marvel owns the fourth dead place now, mm -hmm. and uh, he might know if there's something back there. It, well, I suppose he maybe he sold the. Uh, I think maybe he just owns a part on the barn and house side. Uh, I would think it would be nice, uh, Vernon, if you talked about the, the day you went to see Mr. You went to see Mr. Wilt, and you established the Willis Volstead, uh, the Willis Volstead um, scholarship. Scholarship. Can you talk about that? Because I remember the day you came to school and told Mr. Wilt you wanted to to uh, develop that scholarship. So do you want to tell the camera about that? Oh, the Willis Volstead scholarship. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, we. Uh, we thought maybe a good way to uh, remember Willis would be to establish a uh, scholarship in his name just for graduates of St. Luke uh, Lutheran School. And uh, the idea would be that there would be a fund and then that hopefully would keep going and only the uh, interest would be spent each year in memory of Willis. And so I, I think uh, since then it's grown quite a bit. I don't know how much is in the fund now, but about once a year we get a notice from the school, a newsletter with some of Bertha Blab's stuff. We really <laughs> like Bertha Blab, and uh, <laughs> it tells, uh, often tells who got the scholarship. So we think that's a nice thing. Some of the falsehoods have mentioned they, how nice they think it is and everything. So. And Vernon, tell us about your uh, going to high school and how you got to college and tell us about your degree and then where you worked and where you work, where you retired oh. from. Do you want to start in high school and talk about start that? Start with high school, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I started to uh, high school in fall uh, 1941. At that time there was a yellow brick school. I think it was uh, three stories high and a uh, darker color, that was junior high. It was made out of a lot of wood, I remember, and bricks on the outside. 
and then senior high was uh, for the, or junior high was for the uh, freshmen, and then the sophomore juniors and seniors went to a senior high. So I started to junior high, and uh, I mean, as a freshman. And I was, uh, I was a, because I was a, from the country, I don't, they didn't have enough home rooms for us for some reason. So they put the, the kids from Lindor and the South Side Butler and the kids from the country in uh, Mr. McPhee's group. Mr. McPhee was a woodshop teacher. So we'd go down to the woodshop. We had to have uh, spelling. I think two uh, two afternoons a week for 15 minutes. We go down to Mr. McPhee's shop and sit on the workbenches and do the spelling test or whatever we had to do. But we were spread throughout uh, the building. Uh, we sat in the the backs of the uh, rooms. There were four or five of us. I remember I was in room 27, which. It was Mrs. Thorne's room, and she didn't like having us there. Anyway, we went there, and then uh, then the next year we uh, went to senior high. And what was, for example, in Glen, or in the uh, and I don't know what they call it, it was sort of industrial arts. Nobody ever talked to me about ahead of time about what classes I'd be interested in or what they think I thought I'd be suited for. And I thought I was interested in industrial arts, you know, woodshop and stuff like Willis and uh, Glenn. So I, I took woodshop and uh, mechanical drawing. And uh, I got I got good grades, and gradually I, they seemed to shift me a little bit to uh, be with kids that, that maybe were going to be headed for college. But nobody ever told me that. I just think it sort of developed. And uh, I had a very good teacher, English teacher, Miss Reed Gertrude Reed, who was very good to me. And. Uh, I got to be, uh, I started to write stories and poems for, and they were published in the uh, monthly magazine, the magnet that she was a faculty advisor for. And then when I got to be the senior, she made me the editor, editor in chief of the uh, monthly magazine. And uh, she, I did well in uh, high school. I got all, all A's. Glenn would always remind me I got a V in the uh, gym one time. <laughs> uh, so I, I did all right anyway. And uh, I started to think about going to college. And Miss Reed helped me apply for scholarships, and I think she recommended me. And, uh, I, I was awarded a scholarship. I, I thought I might want to be a journalist, so I was awarded a scholarship to uh, Thiel College. I think it, was, it would have been a freshman scholarship that was maybe related to journalism. And I got a, a rich scholarship, uh, just a loose scholarship from the school, and I got a state senatorial scholarship for writing an essay. And then I got a uh, Carnegie Freshman Scholarship. And uh, one, one day, and maybe this is what I told you before, one day in the hall, Mr. Anderson, the uh, school principal, told, took me aside and he said, you know, Vernon, uh, kids have been, I understand you're uh, applying, you're going to try to take the, uh, that was the Allegheny County scholarship test or something, I forget what they called. He said, you know, the other students have already been practicing 
without exam. And he said, I didn't know you were interested in going to college, so uh, I didn't get you in on that. And he said, besides, I don't know if you'd be admitted to college because you were sort of in the industrial arts thing for the first year or two. And uh, you never took any foreign languages. And he said, it might be pretty hard for you to, to get into uh, college. And uh, he said, one good thing on your record besides your grades is that uh, your sophomore year we gave a uh, reading comprehension test and uh, when you were a sophomore you got the best grade in, in that test of anyone in the high school, high school including juniors and seniors. So he said you have some good things going for you. Anyway, I took the uh, Carney or the Allegheny freshman scholarship test or whatever it was. And uh, I must have done well because I ended up getting a Carnegie freshman scholarship. My Aunt Abby helped me a lot with Carnegie Techs. There was a professor called Mullen a Lutheran professor who, whom she knew, you know, my grandfather Andrew was a minister in New Kensington, and my aunt Abby knew Paul Mullen. She, so she started telling me that maybe you should be an engineer because journalists have trouble getting jobs and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. So. Uh, she actually went with me to Carnegie Tech. I don't know how I got uh, really that interested in Carnegie Tech. I know finally she went with me and uh, I ended up applying. I think it's partly that they told me I could get a Carnegie freshman scholarship. And then uh, she went with me, I know, to the campus one spring. And, and uh, And that was my, that was the spring of my senior year. And it sort of developed that uh, I, I had to take a, a placement test, I think in May at Carnegie Tech. So gradually I was getting more involved with Carnegie Tech. There was actually also a man in Butler, a graduate of Carnegie Tech, that invited me to come, to come up and talk to him. And he told me some good things about Carnegie Tech. So I took a, sort of an engineering type test, I think in May of 1945, just before I graduated. And it was during the war. And uh, Carnegie Tech usually had two semesters a year, but during the, sem uh, during the war they have three semesters for the engineers. They have a summer semester too. So you could start in, uh, June and get a semester in by the end of September. So I applied, uh, went to talk with them and uh, I, th I thought I was interested in uh, drawing. I liked mechanical drawing in high school. So I th I'd asked my mechanical drawing teacher, Mr. Frederick, what I could do going to Carnegie Tech that related to a drawing. He didn't mention in engineering, he just said in the art school you should t you could take industrial design, which involves making drawings maybe related to uh, industry or something. So when I talked to him about Carnegie Tech, I asked if I could start an industrial design in June of 1945. They said no, the art school wasn't open during the summer, but the engineering school was. So you could go to start to engineering school. So they said civil engineering is a little bit like industrial industrial design. So they sent me to Dr. Mavis, who was the head of uh, civil engineering, and he got out a book, big book showing all this. The civil engineers have a list of all 
the registered engineers that were in the profession, I guess. So he said, this is a, the book, all the names, they're not all going to last forever, and you can get a job as a civil engineer. So, so I started to school with, in engineering with the, in June of 1944. And uh, I thought I was 17 then, and I probably drafted it. What did I say it was? It would have been 45. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd be drafted because I was, I'd be 18 in December. So I thought I'd, maybe I'd get one year, one year in or something because all the engineers took the same stuff for the first year anyway, same basic stuff. So, so I went to school and uh, I did uh, my army physical in that December and I passed it. And by the time I passed it, I started my, the first semester of my uh, junior year and they gave me a deferment to uh, June of uh, 1946. In the meantime, I took ROTC at, at school and uh, did some of the military training with the ROTC people. Maybe I could mention that uh, John Nash was one of my uh, classmates. Did, did you see uh, Beautiful Mind? Oh, it was a story about a... Did you see it? Huh? It was a story about John Nash who was an outstanding, turned out to be an outstanding music uh, mathematician. It happened he was in one of my uh, physics classes and I had a physics lab with him. You know, I would say hello to him on campus, but I, he was sort of a loner. But, and I, was, I actually rode a, a train to uh, Rockenridge. I lived with Aunt Abby the first two semesters in Brockenridge, so I rode a train to Pittsburgh from Brockenridge and then about each day. And, uh, so I didn't get to know a lot of people at school. I got to know a lot of people on the train. And uh, we'd get off at Shadyside Station and some of, them, some of us would go to Pitt and some would go to Carnegie Tech, but we walked together as far as we could. Anyway, by, uh, when I thought I'd be going to the Army in June of uh, 1946, the, the draft ended. I don't know if the years sound right. Anyway, the draft ended, so I never went to the Army then. Uh, so I went to school my senior year in high school, and then uh, my freshman year in college at Carnegie Tech, and two semesters. Then I went to summer school again the next year. And uh, by going to summer school, I actually finished at Carnegie Tech in three years, isn't it? One of the good things I did at Carnegie Tech was uh, I got the most promising uh, senior engineer award, which made me feel good. It was just for the engineering students. John Nash was a mathematics student, so he wasn't in the competition and some of the others. It was only among the engineering students. All the time while I was in Butler High School and uh, going to Carnegie Tech, I worked. Uh, at, my first job was at the pottery, Sachsenburg Pottery, with uh, George Adderholt and Rowan Cooper. Mm. And uh, then I got a job at the Armco. Uh, we were allowed to work two shifts a week at the Armco as a laborer, so 
I worked there. Often we'd go uh, for a night shift and uh, work on labor reserve, and they'd send us wherever there was somebody missing. They, they, were, they needed help so much during the war that uh, there were women working and everything. So, And sometimes my high school teacher, we'd, we'd leave uh, high school and get on a bus <coughs> in Butler and ride down to the Armco. And sometimes my high school physics teacher would ride the same bus with us down to the Armco. I think he had a better job than we did. We worked on labor reserve. And anyway, I worked uh, part time all the way through my uh, time in the Carnegie Tech until I job, got a job with a. Pittsburgh Industrial Engineering. So after I got my master's degree, I worked with uh, Pittsburgh Industrial Engineering as a field engineer. I climbed with the uh, iron workers, and uh, one of the first jobs was at Glenshaw Glass in uh, going down Route 8 on the right hand side. And they were. Uh, putting a, an addition, attaching it, there are big steel tanks there, and uh, they were attaching trusses to the rolling trusses work to the steel tanks and out over the, the thing, place where the railroad cars came in. And one of the first days I was up there, to, I guess the iron workers knew I was a little queasy. We, we were looking out down over the ends. It was about 30 or 40 feet high and I felt something on my shoulder and it was a rubber gray mouse and the iron worker behind me <laughs> had slid a gray mouse down over my shoulder. I think if I had jumped he would have grabbed me. But anyway, another day uh, I got to know him a little bit and kidded with him and uh, the iron workers would have ropes. In the morning somebody would go up, up higher and climb lifelines, they call them, higher one end, and the other end of the lifeline would be around the, our, each iron worker's uh, chest. I didn't have a lifeline, but anyway, uh, I told this one iron worker, you know, uh, the guy that tied the iron the, the lines this morning, I don't think he likes you very much. <laughs> and uh, I said, I wouldn't trust a lifeline. And he said, oh, I trust it. And he jumped off the side of the building and swung out and swung back in. And he said, see, I told you, be okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, probably wandering too much. But. So then, uh, I guess what I was getting to there, work for Pittsburgh Industrial Engineering for about a year, 48. I got a, uh, maybe just for the summer, and I worked part-time weekday afternoons, a couple of afternoons a week, and then uh, I worked for them one summer. And I, I applied, Dr. Mavis, the head of civil engineering, said I should apply for a top eight of pi, uh, national fellowship. Top eight of pi is to engineers Engineering students like uh, Phi Beta Kappa, the fine art student. And each year they awarded um, four scholarships. So I was awarded a Tau Beta Pi, uh, National 104 Tau Beta Pi, National Scholarships, Fellowships, I guess they call for a year. And that was long enough to get my uh, master's degree. So I got my master's degree in civil engineering in, at Carnegie Mellon in, uh, they call it Carnegie Tech in 1949.
And then we got married in 1950. And I belonged to a reserve unit. I thought if I ever went to the army, it'd be good to go as an officer, at least with a unit uh, that I could, uh, knew. And I found out that if you had a bachelor's degree in engineering, you could apply to be a uh, to get a direct commission in, in the army. So I applied for a direct commission and. Uh, and I got it, so I joined a, uh, I got to be a second lieutenant, I thought as an engineer, but they had a uh, unit in Pittsburgh that had a vacancy for um, a lieutenant, a second lieutenant, reserve unit, and uh, it was, they call it the uh, 371st Convalescence, and it was a, uh, it was supposed to be like near a mash, the hospital in Mash, only after the, the guys got out of there, they would go to a reconditioning unit like ours and uh, stay there maybe to recover enough that they could go back to battle. So, so somehow I got onto that unit and I start going to uh, uh, reserve meetings. Usually there would be, I don't know, 20 or 30 guys there, some women, maybe nurses, and uh, I remember one meeting I went, after we got married, we got married in July of 1950, and the first meeting I went to after the, the commanding officer was standing up there, always a little bit late, maybe five or ten minutes, the commanding officer was already saying, I know it's a, so, too bad we're the first unit called out for duty, but we're war, so. <laughs> so we were the first unit out of Pittsburgh called to go to uh, Korea, actually, and we left on September 3rd, 1950, I think, as a unit. And even though there were many doctors who had been paid one or two nights a week to go to the meetings, there was only one doctor who was able to go with the union, who, and he had been an old, he was an older doctor, and he was used to be he had been in the World War II or something like that. They said if you don't have one doctor in a medical unit, you, you don't have enough to start out even. So, so we went, and uh, the rest of us were all other types of people. And the troop train left Pittsburgh, and we got to St. Louis. And some of the families were driving. We were supposed to go to Texas to train as a unit because we didn't have any training together. And we got to, to uh, St. Louis. We had orders. The whole train lot of us was diverted to Fort Lewis, Washington. And uh, so uh, some of the families that were headed to uh, Texas they couldn't get in touch with them, so when they did get in touch with them, some of them decided to go home and some of them decided to drive on to Fort Lewis of Washington. But then they decided that in Korea that it wasn't the right type of uh, battle for fixed lines. There was no place to set up a unit like ours, they decided. So they disbanded us. and. Uh, then I think they looked at some of our backgrounds and they sent me to uh, Fort Sam Houston to train as a medical service officer. But the uh, first training I got was in first aid as a battalion surgeon's assistant. And then they sent me to, uh, I was there for a month, and then they sent me to uh, Fort Dix where they had a good preventive medicine unit in a tried to train me as an army sanitary engineer and inspector, and which turned out to be a good deal. When I, I worked with a uh, good doctor, uh, Colonel Opolsky, and uh, I learned to be a sanitary inspector and to do sanitary inspection, collect mosquitoes and uh, stuff like that, mainly for army health because I was a sanitary engineer, they called me, but, and then, uh
the uh, nice things that happen was they were doing uh, tests with uh, Dr. Salk, Jonas Salk. At that time he had a lab in Pittsburgh and he was developing flu vaccines and he was working on uh, flu at that time. So he, he came to work with the preventive medicine unit at Fort Dix a few days every now and then. And the idea was to give shots uh, to some of the soldiers. He had been giving shots to monkeys and they were going to try them on some of the soldiers. To, and uh, so I got to meet Jonas Salkman, which was nice, and Eileen got to meet him too. And we had dinner with, with uh, them one evening. He asked me, since I was a sanitary engineer, he had monkeys in his lab in Pittsburgh, and the neighbors which were starting to complain about the odor. <laughs> and he asked me what to do. And uh, I said, I, I told him I have no idea. And uh, he said that what he was, had started work on was using activated charcoal, and he had fans and uh, air conditioners, and they'd blow through activated charcoal, and he thought that would do the job. Anyway, I met, met some nice, nice people in the uh, army. I, I went from Fort Dix, they sent me to Governor's Island, which was, the army is divided into six areas in the United States mainland. And the first army area is New York and New England, New York State and New England. Governor's Island is in uh, the cost of the Statue of Liberty in uh, the harbor in New York City. And Eileen was with me, and she got to stay in a um, an apartment on Governor's Island. We stayed together in an apartment, and then I went to an office every day for a month. And then they sent me from Governor's Island to um, Camp Edwards, Massachusetts, which was on Cape Cod. And I got to be the post sanitary engineer for the rest of the state. So I ended up with a really a good deal, and uh, I got to ride out to Camp Golfe uh, uh, near Provincetown. The Army had, had an aircraft training on Camp uh, Cape Cod, and they would have a air, little airplane and drag a uh, target past Camp Golfe, and they'd fire over the ocean at the target. So I spent two years there, and then I came back out I, when I got out of the army. I uh, came back and I worked for Alcoa as an equipment design engineer in Kensington for 52 to 54. And I had the idea maybe I could go to graduate school, so I started to go to uh, graduate school at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. Carnegie Tech didn't, I, was, I thought I was ready to start a doctoral program, and Carnegie Tech didn't have a, a doctoral program. And, and so I started to uh, Carnegie, or to Pitt in uh, the math department as a doctoral candidate not a candidate, just a student. And uh, when I looked around me at uh, Alcoa, there were older engineers who had been going for year after year to night school at Pitt. And uh, I got to thinking at the end of some period that have taken classes, I'll have some kind of comprehensive exam and I've forgotten everything that uh, I've learned at the beginning, and maybe I'll never get it even in nine years. So Eileen and I talked it over, and we decided to uh, that I would apply to other schools. So I applied to uh, MIT and Brown University in Yale because we like New England from being on Cape Cod, and uh, 
the Illinois Brown University said they didn't have anything, and uh, MIT said they might have some, but they weren't sure. I wanted to try to get a uh, an assistantship, so I teach part time and then uh, take classes. And Neil wrote back right away and said they they could offer me uh, an assistantship. So uh, in uh, Arlene. She had helped me start a house down by Rollins, and uh, we, li we had lived there while I worked at Oak Hill. Anyway, we decided to sell it. We packed everything up and went to New Haven, Connecticut in the fall of uh, 1954. And uh, she got a job at Grace New Haven as a registered nurse. And uh, I was, I got a teaching assistant, so I taught mechanical drawing and uh, some first mechanics courses at Yale. And I got paid a little bit, and I had a GI Bill. And with her, with all those incomes, we still just barely scraped along. <laughs> and we got to, uh, I got to Yale in uh, 57 and got my doctor's degree in engineering. to electric boat. There was a nice uh, astronomy professor that uh, helped me learn to use the computer at Yale. He even took me to Columbia and I got a computer grant from IBM while I was at Yale. And uh, he got, he only get the grant and we'd go to uh, Columbia to the Watson lab late in the afternoon <coughs> Uh, we take the train down to uh, Grand Central, Grand Central Station, and I think over to a shuttle to Penn Station, and take a uh, subway up to uh, Columbia University, and uh, on the uh, computer with some problems, and then get on the subway maybe at midnight, and go back down in the reverse and catch it a train at the Grand Central Station and back to New Haven. So it would get back maybe at four in the morning or something. Anyway, I, he, he left uh, Yale and got a job as head of the computers. Digital computers were just being developed and he got a head job as head of uh, the computer section at Yale. And he knew my thesis was related to uh, things they were doing at Yale because he knew some, about some of the programs I worked on. And my thesis had to do with, uh, I had beams, skinny beams, steel beams in the lab and I, had, I hit them with a bar and then I used oscilloscopes and strain gauges and accelerometers to measure the the response and then I predicted it pretty well on a computer and that turned out to make my doctoral thesis. And he said electric boat has similar problems when uh, a submarine is uh, subject, they call it the near miss. If, if a submarine had a direct hit it was done, but if it was a near miss, you know, the mine might explode a hundred feet away or two hundred feet away. They wanted to, to live through it and wanted everything to survive. There wasn't supposed to be any uh, weakest link like, like the one horse Shea. Everything was supposed to go at once or not go at all. And so uh, the problem was to predict the response of especially uh, reactor compartment piping. Uh, that was the time they started to put uh, uh, reactors into to submarines. Rick over Admiral Rick over, you know, was in the Navy and he was the father of atomic submarines, they said. And he was anxious 
I'd have analysis done of the piping. So when I got there, Electric Road had uh, a section devoted to predicting stresses in piping uh, in submarines. Uh, submarines piping also gets stresses when they just when they heat it, heat up the piping, it expands and then it can expand forever and if it can expand then it gets stresses in it so they already had a, a computer program to predict the stresses in uh, three-dimensional piping. Submarines have piping all over the place, big pipes and little pipes and uh, there was a section and they had uh, I think 18 or 20 high school graduates who were good at math and they would get drawings of the piping and uh, they would, uh, you'd have to have the, the coordinates in space of each piping joint and uh, then they'd feed that in and the computer would, and then the, the pipe, the, the size of the pipe that was in between and all that stuff and then they'd predict, predict the stresses so what, what I did, my first job, was to make a um, dynamic version of that. So if you knew the uh, vibration, actually they, we call a spectrum the frequency content of the, the uh, vibration. You could predict the, uh, the dynamic stress. So I actually wrote a computer program for an IBM 704 for electric boat that did the dynamic part. And then gradually they advanced me and uh, I got to be head of the, the, the pipe stress section, head of applied mechanic. And uh, finally uh, the title of uh, chief structural engineer, chief of structural mechanics. They had a chief stop naval architect. Just, stop for just a second. Put in the okay. oh, I don't have another tape. Oh, I've got two. Oh, Run out of space? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay. Tell us, tell us the end. Where did where did you end up after Electric Boat? Well, I ended up after Electric Boat, mm -hmm. then I uh, came to um, Penn State as a uh, actually as, as an associate professor because I taught night school while I was at Electric Boat. I taught night school for the University of Connecticut in the mechanical engineering department. So I actually was able to start as an associate professor at. Uh, Penn State, and, uh, and I was there for, uh, that was in 1962, mm -hmm. and uh, then I retired in 1992. I had 30 years, 33 years of credit for ret total retirement because they gave a 10 cent bonus to retire early. <laughs> they were trying to get people to retire and then they gave me credit for uh, my years of service in the Army. So now I still go to. Uh, Some other professors are retired. We have a group called the Romeos. It's retired old men eating out. <laughs> so we get together once a month and uh, sit and talk about nothing in general. And Can't hear. Anyway, that's it. About <laughs> the end of it. <laughs> One of those people that that started in this little one-room school, and where you went was just like Phew, the sky's the limit. And the kids need to know that uh -huh. that that uh, it doesn't have doesn't matter where you go to school, but it's how you apply yourself and yeah, that's what you do with it, and what you do with what God gave you. Yeah, I was lucky. I had a good background. And I had good teachers. And John Fole said we liked. He came up. He and uh, 
Johnny Newbert and Chuck Claus came up one time. They were selling, uh, learning to sell uh, AAL insurance, I think. John mentioned it. It seemed that everything I touched turned to gold, and uh, it wasn't because of me. It was just I was lucky. God had a plan. Yeah. <laughs> he had a plan for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've had a good life. Eileen, you had children? Yeah, five. Oh, you had five children? Yeah, two, oh. two boys and three girls. And yeah. where are they now? Okay, the uh, oldest boy lives near us. And he teaches school, uh, eighth graders, and uh, English is his big thing. And uh, sort of following his dad here without it. And uh, Clay uh, works for Pepsi. He's retired now. He lives in Wyoming, but he is uh, pretty good at art. He's been doing calendars for the Pepsi company for a few years now. And we have Kathy who teaches school uh, art, and she's near uh, uh, Carlisle. And uh, Wendy uh, is um, in Houston, Texas, and works for an oil company. And our youngest, who did not go to college, the all the four did, works as an engineering something or other. She has a really good job that you talk about where you come from or how you apply yourself. She gets jobs over college graduates, men, and she just she just has the nicest way about her and gets along with any age, you know, I think she has a lot of her dad in her. And she's a real, you know, she just works and works. And know. she is where? She's at uh, um, Air Products in Allentown. Huh. But recently, the company Jet flew her to Kansas to adopt her. Hmm. Our little Marlene <laughs> from the little farm in Center Hall. So you're right, you see. and she does apply herself, she does work, she, and she's very reliable. If she says she'll do something, she does it, even if she has to stay up all night, you know, she's, she's just like he was, you know, work hard. And, so, yeah. Far flung. Are we run out, did we run out yet? One minute. <laughs> One minute left. We're done. Two hours. <laughs> Two hours, that's too long. Oh, no, that's wonderful.